Welcome to Fort Francis on the shores of Rainy Lake. Coming up on this episode of the new Fly Fisher, we're fishing the big water for big fish. We're with professional guide Scott Hamilton, and we're on the make for absolute giants. Big pre-spawn smallmouth bass and giant post-spawn northern pike. This big fish adventure starts right now on the new Fly Fisher. Oh, this guy came out of nowhere. Ooh, that's a nice sized fish. What? <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. The new Fly Fisher is brought to you in partnership with Destination Ontario, Orvis Fly Fishing, Scientific Anglers, Trout Unlimited, WeatherTech Canada. In the northwest of Ontario, there are a few big bodies of water that bear legend. Big lakes that are home to giant predators, where they all live a life of eat or be eaten. This lake, spanning 360 square miles or nearly a thousand square kilometers, shares borders with both the US and Canada. Welcome to one of the jewels of Sunset Country. Welcome to Rainy Lake. Along the shoreline of Rainy Lake is the small border town of Fort Francis. And in Fort Francis is home away from home for many traveling anglers to northwestern Ontario. The Rendezvous Hotel. A staple stopover for travelers heading north to adventure. Many people overnight at this wonderful hotel not realizing the world-class fishing just on its doorstep. Well, we're here to experience all that Rainy Lake has to offer based out of the rendezvous. It's early season, early May to be exact, but the spring is growing long in the tooth. With ice out early and recent warming temperatures, we have a great shot targeting post-spawn northern pike and pre-spawn smallmouth bass. Though things are about three weeks early, Mother Nature reminds us of where we are. Northwestern Ontario. Looks like on this adventure we'll be chasing temperatures as high as we can find. Local guide Scott Jackfish Hammy Hamilton, 25 year Rainy Lake veteran, will be showing me the Rainy Lake ropes. It's day one on the water, and Scott and I are well prepared to handle whatever Mother Nature throws at us. It's cold, but completely fishable. This morning, we're after post-spawn Northern Pike. Well, good morning. First thing in the morning, it's already snowed and uh, it's cold, but it doesn't mean that these pike aren't gonna be active. Water temperature is about 46 degrees and um, you know we're chasing temperature this morning, but until we can find those temperatures, what we need to do is really slow things down. These pike are gonna be grumpy, sulky, and uh, you need to really let that fly hang in their face to enlist, enlist a bite. Uh, so we're just gonna take it slow, find some shallower water, find some dark, back bays, looking for these post-spawn pike, looking to feed up. We have a slot limit on uh, pike and rainy lake that uh, we cannot keep any fish any larger than 27 inches long. So it starts to create a trophy lake. So there's a lot of big pike here. 
We start in the highest percentage of spots, a back bay with last year's vegetation still standing. If there are pike to be caught, they should be in this right kind of area. Question is, of all the bays that look right, is this the right one? We start off with a big bird streamer and start prospecting. Right, that gets the stink off. We're First on. fish of the day. Stink on. <laughs> They're pretty they are and they're yeah. thick, they're not super clean. They're not sneaky. Yeah. So Scott, why why have you chosen for us to come into this area in particular? I mean it you know, is it because it's a spawning bay or in the, the time of year it's post spawn? Yeah, it, well it it could be that we got some late spawners too. But I, I kind of think that the reason that I like these areas is it opens up to the big lake. It's got access to shallow water still. There's lots of cover for the fish. If the weather isn't great, they can dump the deeper water quickly. Or if it gets nice and warm and they're chasing minnows and other bait fish, they can go shallow. And they like to ambush at these little pockets and little holes in these reed lines. So you always look for runs and pockets where these pike like to ambush fish to come in. That's why I pick areas like this. We moved a couple of pike in the same size category as that first one and decided to switch things up a bit by waiting for things to warm up. I pull out my six weight and we begin our search for smallmouth. So I'm actually using the, the, the line tip as an indicator, as a strike indicator, where the line and the and the tip at meet. Yep. Line and the leader. If there's that line jumps at all, set the hook. Do you see the line stretch out? Yeah. If that tip where where they meet, if it moves at all, yep. there's a fish on it. But the problem is now is these small mouths with this temperature they're cruising, right? Yeah. They're gonna move along these banks. Yeah. You just you're gonna move along, you'll get into them. And you put one in front of it and Yeah. And you'll catch ten or fifteen in one spot. That's what it works on rainy anyway. You, once you find them, there'll be a bunch. And then, then you then you gotta move on. Come on, eat it. He's following it. See him? Yeah. yeah. It's a decent fish. Yeah, it is. Again, I told you, these fish aren't starving. They got lots of food, so you gotta fool them. They got, they, you know. What I'm doing here is I'm actually adding a sink tip to this floating line. The reason is, is because I'm not getting this little Murdoch minnow down fast enough. So I'm gonna add a six inches per second sink tip on it, and then I'm gonna tie my nautable leader right to the sink tip.
nothing. <laughs> All right. That's looking pikey, but no, it's a bass. Is it? Yeah, it's a good one too. Excellent. Not gonna lie, today's been a struggle. The water's cold, and we've really had to work for any bites that we're getting. And uh, I switched up to a smelt pattern. We found some warm water. We're in 50 degrees, and coming along this rocky shoreline. We found a really nice smallmouth. But that's it, that's it for cold water fishing, man. You gotta put your time in. You really do have to put your time in and pick apart all the structure that you wanna fish. Find the temperature, because when it gets to be 48, 50 some degrees, they are gonna come in from their deeper haunts, chasing bait fish. Woo, here we go, nice. Let's take a look at this. Now that is a great way to start a trip here on Rainy Lake. Awesome. So when the water's cold, find the warmest temperature you can, slow things down, and hopefully things will work out. We struggled in the cold temperatures for the next hour or so and decided it was time to go back to rendezvous for supper. Tough day to start, but the water is warming fast. Day two, we wake up to bluebird skies, slightly warmer temperatures, and an amazing boat ride with Scott to our first spot of the day. Staying with hunting temperature, and of course, big pre-spawn smallmouth bass. Hemi, another day on Rainy Lake. Uh, a little different today than it was yesterday, huh? Yeah, warmer. A lot warmer. What's the game plan for this morning? Uh, we're going to try and find even warmer water than we did yesterday. And then uh, we're going to still work some shallow stuff. I'm kind of wanting, hoping that we can focus a little bit on the smallmouth because I think they're going to be moving more than anything right now. Right. So, but we're going to look for some good pike spots, but there's going to be some smallmouth caught today. So this morning, water's 46 degrees. We're going to go low and slow double rig woolly buggers. All right, we'll see if we get some of these big smallies, eh? Good. We cast smallmouth streamers for a little while while Scott maneuvered us into a great looking pike bay. So I pull out my big stick and throw out a very bold offering. Top water strikes will be a rare event when the water is this cold. The fish, more often than not, aren't willing to expend the energy to chase it down. But you can consider throwing a big fly out for a couple of casts to grab the attention of any fish in the area. Create a commotion. I cast this popper a couple of times, then switch back to a big streamer. So when normally when I, I, I like to find pike in early season, I'd like to go and look for life in the bay. First thing is you go look, you see birds singing, tweeting, bait balls in the water. If you get life in the bay, there's, that means bigger fish will be in there to eat. And uh, that's what the first thing I always look for in a bay. It's been tough the last few days, but we're finally seeing some now. Generally, as a fly caster, you want the wind coming over your opposite fly arm shoulder. So I'm left-handed, so generally for safety reasons, I want the wind to come over my right shoulder. It keeps the fly away from your person. But there's going to be times when that doesn't happen. So how do you avoid having that fly blow into you on your back cast or your forecast? Well, there's a very easy way to do so to eliminate as many false casts as you can. So what I like to do is get my fly out, let it land, and then use the water to load the rod 
and then shoot it. So you've got your full length of line out with one cast using the water as the water load to get the rod working for your back cast to be able to shoot that line forward. It'll save that fly from scooting into the back of your head or into your shoulder. Give it a try on days that you cannot get that wind over your opposite fly arm shoulder. Oh, did you see that? Yep, he's after it. He's after it. He's looking at it. You're splashing on the surface, which attracted it. That was a nice one. There he is. Oh, he's got it. Oh, this is a beauty. <laughs> oh. <laughs> always, this part, this thing always works for me, this spot. Okay, we got a big one here. We were just doing a, a tutorial on how to cast <laughs> how to cast off your opposite shoulder in the wind. And I was just slamming this fly down on the water so much that I it I brought in this big northern. Put my sunglasses on just in case this fly pops out. And he came and ate it, and it's a good one, man. Oh my gosh. Hammy, they live here and they are big. I can't turn them. No, they're they're a solid fish. Heavy, they're built. They may not be longest, but they're really well well built. Now I've got a nine weight rod here with a nine weight weight forward floating line and a six inch per second sink tip to 25 pound titanium bite wire. Good job, yeah, nice pike. Look how fat that thing is. That is ridiculous. Let me just get my hands wet. You want to catch trophy pike out of Fort Francis? A Place Rendezvous and Hammy's Guide Service. Unbelievable. So fun. Great fish. Great fishery. We decide to resume our hunt for big smallmouth bass and pick up and run to a different part of Rainy Lake, one of Scott's favorite smallmouth haunts. Came off that rock. That's a good one. So I switched flies. We we're getting short struck a lot. That's a nice bass. A good smallmouth. And uh, I switched flies to a uh, one with a stinger hook on it. It's an articulated smelt fly. It looks like with a stinger. This is a nice fish. It just came off that rock pile right there. Now. There's a catch and release season, 365 days a year here. And you can target fish. These are pre-spawn bass. Oh, he's just barely hooked in the rammy. You gotta get her in close. Let's get him in. Good work. That's a nice fish, man. That's what they are. Hand wet. Now that is a fantastic smallmouth. You can see he went for the head, okay, because the front hook is in the lip. This pops right out. And that's a beautiful Rainy Lake smallmouth. Just great sport fish. Okay, so here's the fly he's using. It's a uh, articulated fly with a stinger hook on the back. It's got some green marabou, some green flash. Um, basically looks like, like a smelt, which these fish are eating in here in the spring. Um, 
loop knot to the bite wire and uh, it's game on. It's a great fly. Lots of really cool action. It really darts and dives back and forth. All right, I want to talk about the setup that I've got going into fishing for these big northern pike and big smallmouth bass here at Rainy Lake. Um, the rig that I've got right now is a nine weight weight forward floating line. Okay, and what I realized was my big synthetic flies weren't getting down fast enough um, because I needed to get that retrieve going quickly. Um, so what I did was I added a nine foot type six sink tip onto it and it's attached just by a loop to loop. Uh, the manufacturer does provide lo looped ends and then on the business end there's a, a non-loop and what happens is uh, what you do is you take your titanium wire and you then attach it via a triple surgeon's knot. Now this knot is really sleek and really really compact so that it passes through the guides very easily. Um, the only pr downside to a triple surgeon's knot is every time you want to retie your tippet uh, or your bite wire, you're actually cutting off some of your, your sink tip. So then you've got 25 pound bite wire to your fly. Um, and what I like to do is tie a loop knot to the eye of the fly, uh, simply because it allows it to undulate in a natural motion. So, weight forward, nine weight fly line to a type six, six inches per second sink rate sink tip to your 25 pound bite wire and it's putting a clinic on for these northern pike and smallmouth bass. And the bass are not leader shy, which makes it all that much more fun. Got him, smallmouth, good one too. Nice. So I saw this dark rock patch right ahead of us here. Right in here. Oh, that's a good fish. And I launched this fly over just past the rock to pull it by. And this smallie came out and ate it. And it's a good one. Look at the boulder field that it came off of. This is really cool. Now, again, we're early May. These fish will spawn in June. So we're not disturbing their natural process in any way. They're just in here looking for love, looking for places to get set up. Now they're looking to find in my net. All right, let's take a look at this dude. Another nice fish. Again, attack the head of the fly. This hook was in the fish, not the trailer. Very interesting. <laughs> what fun, early season smallmouth and northerns. Can't be beat. You know you've got options when you fish with jackfish hammy out of Rainy Lake. It's, uh, it's really a lot of fun. You've got the opportunity to fish the north arm of Rainy Lake where you have opportunities of catching lots of smallmouth bass, but the size may not be as big as the south arm of Rainy Lake where you don't catch as many smallmouth, but you really have an absolute chance of catching jackets. Rocks. I'm not winning this. Here you that's go. That's a rock. That's a fish. That's a fish there. Oh, it's another good smallmouth. Oh my goodness, what is going on here? <laughs> it's running for the deep water. <laughs> you got to put them on the reel. I've never had a bass do this before. <laughs> Kidding me? Oh, it's a good one. So the water's warmed up back here. It's 57 degrees. We talk about chasing temperature. We found it. And these fish are resident fish. They're not nomads. In, this war in these warmer back bays, they're hanging around, doing their thing. And uh, they are big. That's a good fish. Now, these fish are in their typical summer haunts, even though it's springtime and they haven't even spawned. You can find them off points, secondary points, boulders, 
any sort of piece of structure that smallmouth call home, they're there. So they're very, very patternable. Good job, Hammy. Yeah, you're welcome. That's a thick fish, man. Look at that. They're pretty. Oh my gosh. He swiped at the head and got the trailer. This time of year, they're absolutely fantastic. Well, that was a fun day. I always love days that provide quality versus quantity and quality is exactly what happened today. A bunch of really nice, big smallmouth bass um, in warm water and two really fantastic northern pike. Can't beat it, man. Rainy Lake is awesome. I can't imagine what it's like when it's really hopping. La Place Rendezvous in Fort Francis, Ontario can be considered by many as home away from home. Family owned and operated, the Rendezvous Hotel is a full service hotel with traditional full amenity rooms, including Wi-Fi, as well as two quaint separate cabins for those looking for a unique Rainy Lake experience. Rendezvous is located right on the shores of Rainy Lake with access to excellent fishing, whether you bring your own boat or fish with Jackfish Hammy. Well, I provide a full day of fishing on the lake. Um, we usually get off on the water about 8 o'clock in the morning, try to be back at the barn by 5. We do a whole day. I've got a number of other guys that work with me. 1, 2, uh, to probably 15 we could get away with. There's so many opportunities for fly fishing on Rainy Lake. There's a lot of back bays you can get out of the wind that hold fish. In June, or, the fish were no much deep, not much deeper than 15 feet. It's a great opportunity for fly fishermen because they can get down to that area. Lots of top water opportunities for pike and smallmouth. Uh, it's it's amazing. We catch a lot of walleyes on flies too. Sarah's Sarah's got one of the the, the larger, uh, nicer facilities on the Canadian side of Rainy Lake. The hotel has a full service dining room and is well known for its excellent cuisine. And of course. The patio is legend. And what's so nice about it, you get up in the morning and we can pick you up at the dock in the back, right behind the, behind the building. Uh, it, it, we drop you off and pick you up. You don't have to drive. You just get up in the morning and you're in the boat. It's day three on Rainy Lake and Scott decides to go back to targeting Northern Pike. The water has warmed enough, he feels, the pike fishing may just be turning for the better. If we can get out of the wind, while fishing with Scott, he was constantly referring flies to certain kinds of lures, as well as lures to certain kinds of flies. And if you think about it, conventional tackle and fly tackle are remarkably similar in many ways. All right, for those of you who are thinking about coming to the dark side, coming to fly fish for the first time, that are conventional anglers, you know, there really isn't a whole lot of difference between the two. It's like snowboarding and skiing. You're both doing the same thing. You're going down the hill on snow, but you're doing it in different ways. Conventional fishing and fly fishing, you're both catching fish, it's just different ways. So I'm a fly angler. Hammy, you're a conventional angler. Let's go through the conventional tackle that you use and I'll show you what the equivalent is on the fly side. All right, <clears throat> well, a lot of the time when I, we're fishing quite shallow for pike and, and smallmouth this time of year. So you want something that gets down sometimes, but you also need something that just maybe only go a foot or so under the, under the surface. So I usually start out throwing something like this. Lots of rattle, makes noise. It will sit on the surface. You can use it as a, sub or as a, as a uh, top water bait if you want to. If you don't, you can work it down and let it pop up and work it down. It has lots of action, makes lots of noise. Right. 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 The equivalent to that on fly is something like this which is a perch pattern that is unweighted. But what you can do is you can actually work it down with a sinking line or a sink tip to get it deeper or have it rise up. It doesn't make a difference. Then you've got different size profiles, right? So as you can see, you've got smaller jerk baits, smaller flies. So those two are, are the same. And the same with, with fishing a jerk bait on the surface, right? You also have the opportunity to use poppers 
that stay on the surface to attract smallmouth and northern pike. Oftentimes too, when you're feeling in shallower water, lots of structure around, uh, fish aren't super active, but you know, you can speed up or slow down. I'll often go to a spinner bait like this with a trailer. If you put a trailer on, makes it ride higher, you can work it slower. Or a jig, a hair jig with a little spinner on it, but Blakemore makes them. Now, when it comes to the hair jigs, there are two different styles of flies that you can use to emulate the, uh, the up and down motion of a hair jig. And, and that depends on the retrieval that you use and the actual weight used for the eyes of the fly. So as you can see here, this is a, a dumbbell eye, which is significantly heavier and allows you to work that fly just like a hair jig. Conversely, if you want to slow that, that rhythm down, right, and you don't, you don't want such a fast sink rate, you switch to a steel eye which sinks at a much slower rate than a barbell eye. You're versatile, you can do a lot of things with one fly, depending on the type of line you're using. Absolutely, now there's one thing that is universal in conventional angling and fly fishing, and that's fishing surface lures. So whether you're fishing poppers, like this salty jack, or a terrestrial as they're called, which is this little guy, which is called a pipsqueak to emulate a mouse, there really isn't anything in conventional angling that fly fishing can't match perfectly. Exactly. I tie on a medium-sized streamer and see if this new fly will produce. Well, we got a million little pike in here. Another fish. That one's a little better. Yep. We've been fishing light colored flies since we got here and I switched to a Halloween color, orange and black. We have three casts and two fish, so hopefully this will turn the big girls on. Nice and easy. Gone. Gone. If you can find the bait ball, you know that there's going to be big northerns hanging around it. Waiting for one to look the other way, to slip up and move in and attack. Is that Are those big females now in the deeper water? We cast outward and caught one. But really, is, we're not talking much deeper. We went from three and a half to five and a half feet, you know? This whole bay is no deeper than five and a half feet, six feet. So you're not, you're not deep and deeper, you're just covering more water in a lot of ways too. But that's one of the things that you can't forget as an angler is that depth is a form of structure. Yep. Right? Yep, for sure. So everybody, I'm, I'm completely used to always casting to shore because generally that's where the structure is, whether it's wood or rock or what have you. Mm -hmm. But when you're fishing early season fish and there isn't lily pads or weeds or grass up, depth is the structure. There you go, got him. You ran at me, that's a good fish. That was weird. He ate it and swam toward Straight the boat. towards the boat. They're scattered all in here. So I, you know, you, you get into a habit of casting to shore all the time. Just cast to shore, cast to shore. Yep. You know what, just look behind you every once in a while. Throw one over your shoulder. And uh, that's what I did in here. And this fish came and ate it, but ate it so weird. For a really cold morning? Well, look at look at it, Hammy. You know, it, it's a cold morning, but it's the warmest water morning we've had, had yep. since we started, right? Yep. So when we started, it's 50 degrees. Um, every other day so far has been, you know, high, mid 40s. But this is males. They're long and thin. Usually, uh, they're just they're be they beat up a little bit because they've been after the females for spawning. And it, yeah. this they spawned. I mean days ago, not weeks, days.
Here's one. Ooh, that's a better one. It's all about life, right? It's all about life. If you can see life in the bay, that's birds, that's bugs, it's minnows, anything that, that these big predators are, you know, come and... I can't even move it. This is a nine-weight rod. I can't move it. <laughs> I was just going to ask you, Scott. We caught that male. And... Uh, we Look caught, at the bait fish. Look at it. We caught that male. This is good fish. Yep. Get away from that trolling motor. We caught that male, and I was going to ask you, you know, does that mean these big fish, now that they've spawned, the big females are in the deeper water? I threw one out into the deeper water. Oh, yeah, well, they're in the center of the bay. Like, maybe, you know, our, our mistake is, is trying to focus too much on structure, and sometimes you just have to fan cast the whole area. Oh, what a great fish. Swim in there. Yes. yes we got her. Best fish of the trip. <laughs> oh, and the, look and the come fly out. just came out. fly just fell right out. Let's get my mitts on her. Yeah. Look at this. Oh. Well, there you go. <laughs> 32, 34? Yep. But fat. Look at the belly on her. Thick, yep. And across the back, just a fantastic animal. Really? Look at the tail. Look at the dark tail. That's so amazing. Something just... Yep. Ate something on the surface something over there. Something just died over there. <laughs> I saw it. there. He got him? Got him. Oh, that's why you always fish your flies right back to the boat. Right to the leader, right to the boat. These fish do not care that there's a boat in their lair and they will attack right there. This one hit right at the side of the boat. Look, my leader's in the in the eyes of the rod. Oh, well, this isn't fighting. This guy's, he's caught. He's done. And just survived. Was strong enough to, to get away. That's a thick fish Look at too. you can see right at the bite marks. So some big boy, well, probably a big lady, grabbed her right, grabbed her right here. They're very tough. Okay, ready to let them go. Gone. After a few non-committal fish showed interest, I decided to switch flies to a black over orange fathead. Scrap. Oh Jumper. yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> so the clouds came in, and uh, everything just went really negative, like super negative. So I adopted a technique taught to me by Colin McEwen a couple of years ago, where he said, "When it gets really negative like that, just go painfully slow." And that's what I was doing, just slowly stripping this fly just off the bottom. And sure enough, it worked. This guy came and picked it up. That's a decent fish. On that fat head. See, it just goes to show you, they're here. Yep. They just get negative on you. Yep. As soon as those clouds rolled in, hey, Hammy, it well, just Well, the weather's so suspect right now, it doesn't take much for it to go sour. She's had enough. Decent fish. Whoa! <laughs> She's caught off. And he's gone. <laughs> I should have used the bigger net. <laughs> That's fun. She was bigger than we thought. But when it's negative and things go slow, just slow your presentation right down. Slow it right down. Awesome stuff. Here you go. Nice and slow, out in the middle of nowhere. Yep. 
slows the ticket when yep. it goes negative like that. Yep. Just slow everything down. It's not a giant, but you know what? No. When they're negative, it's fun catching any kind of fish, right? <laughs> but you also notice how this fish isn't fighting anymore? Yeah. Uh, this cold weather, it just shuts them off physically even, I think. They just become, le you know, Super lethargic. Super lethargic, yeah. Well, Hemi, what do you say we switch to smallmouth? Let's do. I love smallmouth. But we always come back. That sun pokes up. Yeah, we're back here. For we'll sure. We'll come back. Great stuff. I think it's really important when you're fishing for pike in early season, well, pike at any time, really, um, that before you make the decision to switch flies, go through your arsenal of retrieves before you do. Oftentimes, it's not the fly. It's how the fly is being presented that will trigger those fish to eat. So, yeah, before you switch it up, make sure that you've gone through your arsenal of, of retrieves and exhausted that before you switch flies. Doesn't matter which fly you got on, if you're not working it right, it isn't going to work. That slow technique just works every time. Down. It is a big, big walleye. It hit like a ton of bricks. Ugh, a ton of bricks, though. I haven't even seen it yet. That's a small mouth. That's a, a huge good one. small mouth. <laughs> That's a huge one. <laughs> good. I can't believe it. Yeah. On an eight weight. <laughs> <laughs> the big fly. Big fish. Oh, it's a tank. Yeah. It's a tank smallie. Oh, yeah. What a way to end the day here on Rainy Lake with an absolute fantastic, chunky, chunky smallmouth bass. Good fish. Look how fat she is. What a way to end a great day of hunting temperatures. Back to the rendezvous for some well-deserved dinner and drinks. Equipment for this Rainy Lake Rendezvous Hotel adventure in Fort Francis, Ontario is as follows. For pike, I was throwing eight, nine, and 10 weight rods, nine foot in length with both matching floating weight forward fly lines, as well as intermediate matching lines. For smallmouth bass, it was a six weight rod with intermediate six weight lines to get the flies a little deeper. Leader material was three feet of 30 pound nylon leader Tied to that, 18 to 20 inches of knottable bite wire for pike. Bass was a tapered 1 and 2x leader to the flies. It's our last day here on Rainy Lake fishing out of the Rendezvous Hotel with Scott Hamilton. We decide to swing for the fences and target a giant. A giant northern, that is. What's the worst thing that could happen? Meanwhile, while the water warms up, we warm up fishing for smallmouth.
awesome stuff. All right, let me show you the rig we got this guy on. So I've got a six inch per second sink tip attached to my floating line, triple surgeon's knot to a 3X tapered leader to my first fly, which is a cone head minnow pattern, little streamer with some orange feather tail, about 18 inches of 2X tippet material to a small little skull head creature fly. Kind of looks like a muddler minnow, kind of looks like a, geez, I don't know. It's got a little bit of flashaboo in the tail. Insect, could be an insect. Could be anything. Could be a larva, could be dragonfly nymph. Just awesome stuff. There he is. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is a giant. It's nothing but dead weight. It's a big smallmouth. Oh, I got him foul hooked. He went after the he went after the minnow and got got it in the back. Well, I think he got your nymph, didn't he? He's got it in the dorsal fin. The dorsal fin. That's the, you know, that's, that's a real reality problem fishing a two fly rig is oftentimes the fish will take the point fly or, or swipe at the point fly, miss it and get, and get the dropper in the back or in, or in a fin of some kind. And that's what's oh. happened here. Um, oh God, he doesn't want to get, can't get the head towards where I need him. There, there he go. goes. That's a nice fish. Okay. So here's what I'm talking about. This smallie came after, oh, that's a good one. He came after this fly right here, swiped at it, missed, and the dropper actually went right in, right in. Barbless pops right out, but regardless, he tried to eat light-colored fish, huh? Pretty, isn't she? Yeah. Got a little battle scar on her side. Go back to your business, baby. Okay, I'm going to show you a trick to, uh, if you're going to put a dropper onto your point fly. Um, so that if it's cold or if you know you've got hair in the way of your fly or anything that you can you can actually tie your dropper tippet on without any problem. So what you do is you take your you take your tippet with your right hand, you give it a twist, creating that set of loops. Next thing you do is you take your tag end and you put it through the loop that you just created. So that's what you're looking at. You then take your hook and you put it through the loop that you just created, hang on to the tag end, and pull everything tight. There you go. All set and ready to fish. Bending that rod pretty nice. Yeah, it is. It's a good one. Came off that point. All the smallies we've had today have come off, off the point, and generally they have a couple of boulders on them too. And they're the fat, fat females that are getting ready to go up and spawn. Oh, she took the, the streamer. All the fish today have been taking the dropper fly. Not this one, though. There we go. Nice. Not a giant, but you know what? On tough days, these are fun. I needed that. <laughs> you know what? You put your time in and it's gonna, oh, he came no! loose. No. Remember when I asked what the worst thing that could happen was? Well, I just lost a fish of a lifetime, an absolutely giant 
Northern Pike. No! That was it. That was the big fish of the trip. At the 11th hour, we lost it. I can't believe it. I saw it too. It came right out. Oh, what a heartbreak. I need to try to catch that fish. Have a great time. See you later. Fish. Out of weight. Got him. Right off this point. Good mm -hmm. one. Nice. We just lost an absolute giant. Giant, giant pike. On the last point we came to. Oh, it's a big lark. It's a big smallmouth. Is it? Yeah. Good. We'll get him. He took that big, big fly. He took that giant fly. <laughs> And it's a big smallmouth. Oh yeah, he is. <laughs> well, if you lose a big pike, you might as well get a big smallmouth, right? Oh, get him! Come here, you. Nice. <laughs> this fly come out too. This makes losing that giant northern. All right. Show him the fly. That's no small fly there, man. It's a pike fly. <laughs> yeah, why would he eat that guy? You know, look, look at, at the size of it. Good stuff. This makes it all better. This makes it okay. Good, good. Smallmouth bass. All right, let's get him back. Thanks very much. Make the pain a little less stingy. Well, that about does it for this episode of The New Fly Fisher. I want to thank Scott Hamilton and Sarah Noonan for their hospitality and their guidance. We've had an unbelievable trip here at Rainy Lake. And uh, for any fly angler looking for a pristine fly fishery for smallmouth bass and trophy northern pike, Rainy Lake is the place to be. My name is Mark Melnick for The New Fly Fisher. Check us out at www.thenewflyfisher.com. Adventure is out there. And what better way than to go and find it with a fly rod in your hand? Thanks for watching everybody and hopefully we'll see you in Sunset Country. The New Fly Fisher is brought to you in partnership with Destination Ontario, Orbis Fly Fishing, Scientific Anglers, Trout Unlimited, WeatherTech Canada,